I'm Nathan Rutherford, and welcome to Myth Madness. In my first episode on Hittite mythology, I talked about how the Hittites called their homeland the Land of a Thousand Gods. And I described how that was a pretty good name for it. The Hittites worshipped tons and tons of gods, and they gained more over time. They gained them from earlier groups of people that combined together into the kingdom of people we refer to as the Hittites, and these same Hittites gained even more gods from nearby people they traded with and fought wars against. Some of these gods were probably just localized versions of the same deity, but the Hittites kept others more distinct, worshipping them individually with different names, for example. But how did the Hittites imagine their gods to be? In ancient Greece, gods are superhuman, acting like humans, with flaws, but with far greater powers to influence the world. Like with the ancient Greeks, the Hittite gods were human beings on a larger scale. They felt love, anger, fear, and jealousy. The gods could deceive others, or be deceived themselves. They enjoyed pleasure and all sorts of entertainment, like dancing, music, horse races, comedy shows mock battles, and athletic tournaments. There were the great gods who lived in magnificent palaces and had staffs of subordinate spirits. These palaces were believed to be located up high in mountains and used as places for gods to assemble together. Outside of the palaces, there were even more gods, a guardian spirit for every rock, mountain, tree, spring, and river. Like the human world, With its kings, nobles, warriors, officials, and peasants, the thousand or so gods of the Hittites were arranged in some kind of hierarchy. The great gods were the most important ones in the Hittite religion. But the lesser ones were important too. They were believed to be intermediaries between the great gods and human beings. For example, two goddesses named Missoula and Zintui served as messengers for the storm god and sun goddess, bringing them the prayers of the mortal worshippers and helping them to make sure the universe worked as it was supposed to. And just like kings and bosses and government leaders in the human world, Hittite gods and goddesses sometimes dropped the ball. They forgot what they were supposed to be doing, and they neglected their divine responsibilities. So what exactly does a lowly human do when a god or goddess doesn't seem to be listening? In ancient Greek myths, you'd kind of be out of luck. The Greek gods usually do whatever they want, and a lot of myths show them favoring or punishing mortals on a whim. The Hittites were a little different. They would still pray to the neglectful gods, but those prayers would often call out the god on their negligence and try and shame them into acting. If you were a good little Hittite and you made all the proper sacrifices and prayers to the Hittite gods, you would remind them of your good behavior and make another appeal for help. You'd say something like, Hello, Tarhun, I did what I was supposed to. This is the part where you make it rain. But the God-human relationship went the other way too. It was very, very important to not neglect a God either. Since they were all powerful, divine justice was brutal. An offended God might take revenge on a mortal, his wife, children, family, slaves, cattle, sheep, and his crop. They could destroy someone completely. And to top it off, a god's revenge may not be swift either. They could take their anger out on you, or instead completely destroy your descendants. There was another catch too. Worshippers had to be certain their god was actually listening when they prayed. Any god can be invoked through prayer to defend justice and punish wrongdoing, but If they weren't listening, the prayer would get lost in the celestial mail. And since gods were all-powerful and no one really knew where one was at any given point in time, worshippers conducted elaborate rituals, and these were designed to grab a god's attention and invite them to where their services were needed. This whole process of getting a god's attention, making sure they were listening, and keeping them nearby was very, very important to the Hittites. Their whole religion revolved around doing exactly this. The reason why the Hittites were so concerned with this is actually fairly simple, and it goes back to the part of the world they called home. The Hittite Empire was located in what is today eastern Turkey, 
at the center of the Anatolian Plateau, a place of rugged mountains and arid, dry steppe. Even though this was the seat of the Hittite civilization, unlike with a lot of other ancient civilizations, it was not an easy place for agriculture. In the summer, it is hot and dry. Rainfall for the whole year almost never goes over 500 millimeters, and the mountain rivers are swift, hard to navigate, and not suitable for irrigation. The best places to grow food are the valleys nestled between the mountains, but the soil here is not super fertile, and the valleys are few and far between. And then, to top it off, winters are very cold, and the mountain snows can completely cut off those valleys from the outside world. When that happens, the people in them have to make do with what they have stored, and hunker down, and wait until spring. In this ancient land, drought and famine were common. So, what did the Hittites do? They lived close to the land, tried their best to work it efficiently and responsibly, and if the gods were also kept happy, the kingdom would be fine. But what if one of those gods became unhappy and decided to get up and go? In that case, disaster was not far away. The Hittites took that scenario very seriously. They had a lot of myths and rituals that addressed that problem. The best preserved are the myths about the disappearance of the god Telepinu, or Telepinu. Before I get to the story, I want to talk a little bit more about why I jumped from Greek myths to this series on Hittite myths. In the first episode on Hittite myths, I talked about how I liked the contrast between the ancient Greeks, who most people are familiar with, and the Hittites, who a lot of people aren't as familiar with. In the previous Greek myth episodes, I was careful to point out the different versions that exist for different stories, and roughly when those versions were written down. My hope was that this would give clues about how a specific myth changed over time, or if different versions existed alongside each other. The reason why I could do this is because a lot of Greek myth story material survived to modern times. Unfortunately, that is not the case with Hittite myths. For them, we often only have broken, half-preserved stories. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we have broken pieces from the same time period that fill the gaps in the same story. The best example is the myth of Telepinu's disappearance. Archaeologists know of three different sources that were written on tablets and excavated from the ruins of Hittite palaces. The three sources are very similar. The words used in them are sometimes almost identical, but each of them also provide extra details that the other two don't have. Today, instead of taking different versions and showing you variations of the same story, what I've done is taken the different incomplete sources and merged them to give you a more clear story. Since the names can sometimes be confusing, and a few different deities just pop up in this story, here is a quick cast of characters. The myth focuses on Telepinu. So who was he? His name means exalted son, and Telepinu was the son of the Hittite storm god Tarhuna. Tarhuna himself appears briefly in this myth, but he doesn't really act like a king of the gods, and is instead fairly useless. A king role is kind of held by the great sun god Nepashash Ishtanu, who holds a big feast and brings all the gods together. Otherwise, the gods in this story come together and make decisions as a group. Two goddesses, Hannah Hannah, a Hittite mother goddess, and another, named Kamrashipa, a goddess skilled in magic and medicine, are going to be very important. They are the two that solve all the problems in this story. The story begins with Telepinu already in a very bad mood. We don't know why. Telepinu is angry, and he says, let there be no threats. He decides to leave, and it's implied that this is a very spontaneous, almost impulsive action. He is so angry, he puts his right shoe on his left foot, and his left shoe on his right foot. He leaves and goes out to the steppe, the meadow, the moors. Telepinu wanders through the wilderness, and when he leaves, he takes with him grain, animal fecundity, luxury, growth, and abundance. With Telepinu gone, these important things are no longer around too and we get a description of the land without them. Mist covered the windows. Smoke filled the houses. In the fireplace, logs were stifled and stopped burning. At the altars, sacrifices could not be made. In the pens, the sheep grew quiet, and the mother sheep rejected the lambs. While in the barns, the cattle were stifled, and the cows rejected their calves too. Cattle, sheep, and humans no longer became pregnant, and those already pregnant could no longer give birth. The mountains and trees dried up, and the spring shoots did not come forth from the soil. 
the pastures and the freshwater springs dried up, and famine broke out in the land. Humans began dying of hunger. The gods themselves were not yet aware of what was going on. The great sun god held a feast, and he invited the thousand gods, all the great gods and also the lesser gods. I imagine it was a magnificent feast, but something strange happened. The gods ate, but couldn't get full. They drank, but couldn't quench their thirsts. Eventually, the storm god Tarhuna noticed his son, Telepinu, was not at the feast. He told all the gods that Telepinu was missing, and that he must have become enraged and removed everything good from the world. So the great and small gods decided to search for Telepinu. The great sun god summoned an eagle and told it to go search the springs and rivers, the high mountains, the deep valleys, and even the blue deep, the sea. The eagle did just that, but Telepinu could not be found. The eagle returned to the great sun god to report just that. Very concerned, Tarhuna went to the goddess Hanahana. He asked her, what should we do? We are going to die of hunger. Hanahana then told Tarhuna to do something, saying, go find Telepinu yourself. Tarhuna began searching. He got up and prepared to leave the city he lived in. He got all the way to the city gate, but couldn't open it. It was rusted tight. Apparently, among all the other things, Telepinu took working door hinges away when he left. So, faced with a stuck door, Tarhuna took out his hammer and tried to use it to open the door. But he only ended up breaking his own hammer. Feeling defeated, the storm god wrapped himself up in his clothes and sat down. He had given up. With that, solving this problem falls to the goddess Hanahana. She summoned a honeybee. She tells the bee to search for Telepinu, and that when it finds him, the bee is to sting his hands and feet to make him stand up, and then the bee is to take wax and wipe him off, purify Telepinu, and then bring him back to Hanahana. But Tarhuna questioned the wisdom of this, asking Hanahana, the great and small gods have been searching for Telepinu but haven't found him. Will this bee find him? His wings are small, and he is small, and he is all by himself. But Hanahana, who is probably getting a little tired of Tarhuna's backseat problem-solving, simply replies, the bee will find him. The bee searched the high mountains, the deep valleys, and the blue deep. It exhausted the honey inside itself, which the Hittites seemed to think was a fuel for bees. But finally, the bee found Telepinu in a forest called Lazina, outside a specific town that is actually named in one of the versions. Telepinu was asleep in the forest, so the bee stung him on his hands and feet. This made Telepinu jump up in shock. Telepinu asks the bee, I was both angry and sleeping. Why did you wake me up when I was sleeping? Why did you make me talk when I was sulking? The bee's sting only made Telepinu angrier. Telepinu knocks down cities, knocks down houses. He destroys people, cattle, and sheep. He thunders with lightning and strikes the dark earth, showing that Telepinu, in addition to being an important god of fertility, is also one of the many Hittite gods with power over storms. While sitting together under the shade of a hawthorn tree, the goddess Kemrashipa watches Telepinu wreck such destruction, and the assembled gods wonder what to do now. One of them suggests summoning a human to purify Telepinu. They want an eagle to bring him home. At this point, there is a lot of hard-to-understand ritualistic text to explain how Telepinu is appeased. The ritual or spell is either performed by Kemrashipa, or possibly by a mortal human. Kemrashipa says that anger and wrath have stifled the soul of Telepinu, like burning brushwood. Offerings of wax and wheat are made to him. Incense is burned. Beer is given to him in hopes that he will get drunk. Twelve rams are taken from the herd of the sun god and sacrificed to Telepinu. The spells call for Telepinu's anger, wrath, sin, and sullenness to be extinguished and not come back just like how water in drain pipes doesn't flow backward. The rituals are designed to force his anger to leave his body, go through the city gates, down the road, past the fields, the gardens, and the forests, and go all the way to the dark earth, the underworld. The purification was successful. Deep in the dark earth, there stood some bronze vats. The lids of the vats were made of lead, and their latches were made of iron. Whatever goes into them doesn't come out, the gatekeeper drew back the seven bars and opened the seven gates of the underworld. Telepino's anger, wrath, sin, and sullenness left him to go down to the vats and be sealed away. Now, purged or appeased of his anger, Telepino came back to his house. It seems Telepino is brought back on the wings of an eagle. Once he returns home, the mist released the windows, 
the smoke released the house. The altars were again in harmony with the gods. The fireplace could be used to honor the gods. Sheep left the pen, and cattle left the barn. The mother sheep looked after the lamb, and the cow looked after the calf. Telepino himself looked after the king and queen of the Hittite land. And that's the story from three different sources combined together. But I want to talk about those three sources for a minute. They were written on tablets made of clay and stored in a temple or palace of a Hittite city. I read direct translations of these tablets when I was putting the full story together. The different texts do not read like a simple story narrative. There are missing words and sections, and there are also several random details that don't really make sense. For example, there's mention of bags hung on poles, and halfway through, when you get to the parts describing how Telepinu was calmed, the perspective of the story shifts, and you get these almost first-person descriptions of how to conduct the ritual. It's also not clear who does the conducting, the goddess Kamrashipa, or a human being, or both at different times. And then later, the ending is written more like a prayer, saying, may Telepinu's anger be extinguished, and not just describing it as being extinguished. So, what to make of this? Well, the different versions are not written like simple stories, because they were not intended to be written as stories. The myths were already known, because they were told orally all across the Hittite world. The likely purpose of these tablets was to instead describe the rituals. In fact, the best explanation I found is that these tablets were written as kind of a play, with a script describing the story, but also including things more like stage directions. This Hittite play was intended to be performed by people so they could reenact the myth of Telepinu's disappearance. The play contained a ritual and described how it should go, but was also part of a larger ritual itself to appease Telepinu himself. And when would such a ritual play be performed? Why, in a religious festival, of course. Festivals were very important to the Hittites. Their calendar was divided into approximately 165 of them. Can you imagine having all that time off work? Individual festivals could last only an afternoon, a couple of hours, or continue for a few weeks. Hittite festivals are like happy hour. It doesn't matter what time it is, there's a festival somewhere. Most of the festivals were in the spring and fall, around the sowing and harvest times of crops. And of course, more than one festival could be happening at the same time. The same festival might be held annually, multiple times in one year, or once every eight or nine years. The Hittite king was a very busy man, and was expected to be in physical attendance at these festivals. There would be lots of music, songs, drums, tambourines, people would visit holy sites, hymns would be sung, and rituals performed. The sacred idol of a god or goddess, usually a gleaming image that was dressed in gold and fancy fabrics, would be brought out of the temple, on a chariot or cart, and carried around. The idol would join the king at the festival's feast, and the king would offer the best meats, the organs, thighs, and fat of sacrificed animals, to the idol. Acrobats, jugglers, practice battles, and wrestling contests all provided entertainment, but they were mostly intended to entertain the watching divine guest of honor. Some festivals were dedicated to more than one god or all of the gods together. The most important gods had their own festivals. The festival dedicated to the god Telepinu was held every nine years. Sheep and oxen were sacrificed, and a ceremonial oak tree was planted in the ground. The myth play of Telepinu's disappearance would be reenacted every time this festival was held. The goal was to ensure Telepinu was listening, present, and happy. With him satisfied, there would be an excellent harvest and famine, which could cause the complete collapse of any ancient society, would be averted. I mentioned before the Hittites were very concerned about getting their gods' attention, and funny enough, they did not just worry about Telepinu disappearing. The Hittites also had a disappearance story for several other gods and goddesses. In one of these, we have the disappearance of the storm god himself, not his son Telepinu. It follows a very similar plot to the disappearance of Telepinu stories. In fact, much of the wording is identical. In this myth, the storm god Tarhuna leaves and takes away plenty, prosperity, and abundance. The description of the land without these things is almost identical to the description in the Telepinu story. The great sun god also holds a feast and invites all the gods and goddesses. 
Once again, they eat but can't get full, and they drink but cannot quench their thirsts. Tarhuna's father, who is not named, is the god that notices he is missing, and the gods search for him. The sun god uses an eagle but is unsuccessful. At this point, there is a divergence. Tarhuna's father goes to his father, Tarhuna's grandfather, and asks, Who sinned and angered Tarhuna, making him leave and cause everything to dry up? The grandfather says it's Tarhuna's father's fault, and then raises the stakes, saying he will kill Tarhuna's father, his own son, and that he should go search for Tarhuna. With that added pressure, Tarhuna's father goes to visit two more divinities. Once again, we have Hannah Hannah, but the additional ones this time are called Gulza, the fate goddesses. Hannah Hannah and the Gulza ask Tarhuna's father why he has come, and he explains how his son has disappeared and how his father, the grandfather, blames him and will kill him. He asks the Gulzas and Hannah Hannah what he should do. Hannah Hannah tells him, Do not be afraid if it is not your fault, because I will make it right. And even if it is your fault, I will still make it right. Hannah Hannah tells him she will find Tarhuna. She tells him to bring a honeybee to help. Again, like in the Talapinu story, she is challenged on how useful the bee will be, but she insists. Presumably, the bee is successful, and a ritual is carried out to appease the missing Tarhuna, but the source is very fragmentary. Since this story and the Telepinu myth are so close, this one may actually help explain some of the hard-to-understand ritualistic text. This text includes references to water being poured out. In other words, as a libation, when water is poured out out of a cup as an offering to a deity. The version ends with a description of the gods eating in the house of Tarhun's father and being satisfied, while Tarhun's father talks about how his son has come home and how rituals were made to drive anger out of his body. Most myths for the other missing gods are very broken and hard to understand, but there are still a few that are interesting. They are also not like the Telepinu and Tarhuna ones. One of them is about another storm god, this one called the storm god of Narek, and he leaves mankind and possibly goes to stay in the underworld. In another, Tarhuna's daughter this time, named Inara, goes missing. Hannah Hannah had previously promised her land and a man, probably as a husband. But after Inara disappears, Hannah Hannah again uses a bee to help find her, along with a female helper. In two more myths, we have the disappearance of two fate goddesses, and even the disappearance of Hannah Hannah herself. I really wish that one was more complete, since she's so important in most of the others but it does include a description of another water libation and how to perform a sacrifice to make her happy again. All of these texts hint at rituals. All of the tablets describe the disappearance of different gods and goddesses and were likely intended as more script and stage directions for festival reenactments just like the one with the Telepinu story. These were intended more as notes, and since the tablets they were written on are broken, the full stories and the ritual details are unclear. Since the Hittites had such a very active religious calendar, with their 160-odd festivals, it's likely that other myth reenactment texts for the same gods, or even different ones, are either lost to history or buried deep under the Anatolian soil, hopefully waiting to be discovered. And that's all for today. Today's episode focused on the Telepinu myth about how one day he was so angry he left the land and took prosperity with him. The beginning of that story featured a line saying he put his right shoe on his left foot and his left shoe on his right foot. In other words, that he put his shoes on the wrong feet. I really like that description. So today, I have an ask. If any of you listeners know of any other myths, legends, or folktales in any culture from around the world that have a character that gets so mad or so distracted that they put their shoes on the wrong feet or even put their jacket on backwards, please let me know send me a message at the podcast website www.mythmadness.com. Next episode, I'll continue with some more Hittite myths. Stay tuned, and thank you for listening.